I love a sunburnt country, a land of sweeping plains, of ragged mountain ranges, and I'll skip to the good bit, her beauty and her terror. And of course, it was about this time last year uh, that this iconic poem by Dorothy McKellar sprung to mind for me as I watched the devastation and the hurt, um, the property loss, and thankfully no uh, life lost with the Tasmanian bushfires that swept through southeast Tasmania. I was in Kettering on the worst day of that, and my father lives some 400 kilometres west of uh, Brisbane in the Lockyer Valley. So as I watched the fires sweep through southeast Tasmania, I was also watching the Lockyer Valley where my father lives under flood for the fourth time in five years. What was most extraordinary about this period though, I thought, was that for the first time ever in a natural disaster or crisis situation that I was observing, Twitter delivered me better, more accurate and more timely information from the ground and the media than any of the traditional media sources. And what was perhaps even more extraordinary that as the fires swept through, what we all know would normally happen immediately following a natural disaster is the community would turn to government and say, what are you going to do to help us? But an extraordinary thing happened post the Tasmanian bushfires and we've already seen the extraordinary Greg Irons. The Irons pet family must be very proud because Greg's uh, extraordinary twin sister, I understand, Mel, set up from her um, kitchen on a laptop uh, in Mount Nelson, some 50 kilometres away from the fire front, or 100 kilometres away from the fire front, a Facebook page, Tassie Fires We Can Help. And I watched uh, with great interest as that uh, website or that Facebook page took off, some 35,000 people over the life of that uh, website interacted. And I watched the community self-organising to fix the problems, to nominate the problems, and to find solutions from their own pro for their own problems. Very rapidly, and there are a thousand stories, and you should go and have a look at it, or talk to Mel to understand what exactly happened. But what was really interesting then is the traditional media two weeks later were criticising the, the state government for not responding to the needs of the community. And the question that I have to ask is, why is government unable to interact with a community that's self-organising using digital tools? And essentially, um, this is what my talk is about today. Now, from Socrates, right back from Socrates and Plato, we as humankind have had debates about various communications technologies and their advancement and whether they are good for us or bad for us. Socrates, of course, argued that the written word, this new communications technology, would ruin great oratory. Uh, Plato op argued uh, that, yes, uh, it may have some effect on great oratory, but the ability to take the written word and spread great speeches far and wide to assemble crowds that weren't there at the original uh, telling of that speech uh, would be a great boon to society, to community, and so on. Perhaps both of them were right. So too with any advancements in communications technology now, we're still having a debate about whether ubiquitous connectivity, and I'll explain what I mean by that in just a moment, is a good thing for our community, our economy, our whatever, uh, or a bad thing. And no doubt, some of you even after this speech will have uh, many concerns about the changes to communications technologies, just as Socrates and Plato did. Uh, aptly, this is a definition of ubiquity from dictionary.com, but when I talk about ubiquitous connectivity, what I really mean is a bit like what Clay Shirky, fellow TED talker, I can now say that with some authority, uh, says when he says, uh, maybe I have to wait 15 minutes until I've finished, uh, he says, uh, it's only when technology gets really boring does it get really, really interesting. Now what I mean by that is if I asked you, the crowd assembled here three or four years ago, who has a smartphone in your pocket, perhaps 10% of you would have put your hand up. Now I'm sure, though I can't see you with the lights up, uh, if I ask that question, 95 to 100% of you will say, put your hand up and say, yes, I've got a smartphone. 
That's what I mean by ubiquitous co connectivity. And what, uh, what that really means is that when the 5 and 10% of early adopters like me have one of these, they're kind of interesting to nerds like me, uh, but it's only when they're ubiquitous that they get really, really interesting in terms of a transformational tool. And I would argue that ubiquitous connectivity is driving three great transformations across our planet that are having a massive impact right here in Hobart and across all of our uh, communities. The first is extraordinary new ways of creating wealth, but some of the old ways we used to create wealth are being disrupted and destroyed. Uh, disruptive new ways for governments, corporates and communities to communicate with each other. Uh, but of course, the flip side of that is sometimes the community can talk back, just as Alan Jones found out uh, after he made some injudicious comments about the of our former Prime Minister. And thirdly, and I think perhaps most interestingly, ubiquitous connectivity and a digitally empowered community are creating extraordinary new ways of solving old and wicked public policy problems. And Mel Irons proved that with Tassie Fires, We Can Help. And my assertion to you today is governments, not just here, but across Australia and across the world, need to much better understand this, uh, otherwise the community is going to bite back. This is a uh, T-shirt I own. My wife, Larissa, won't let me wear it out of the house, so uh, it only ever gets worn as pyjamas. I bought it in 2006 from a website called threadless.com, from which I've now bought 20 or so fairly nerdy t-shirts, not unlike this one, uh, since then in the ensuing seven years. So what you might say, an online retail t-shirt shop, you shouldn't even be shopping in Hobart, that's what you would have said to me two or three years ago. Uh, <laughs> uh, well, actually, it's much more interesting than that, Threadless. Because what Threadless really is, is a great example of the new business models that are emerging, uh, empowered and enabled by ubiquitous connectivity. Threadless doesn't actually design t-shirts or make t-shirts. All they really do is create a marketplace in which designers of t-shirts and nerdy people like me who want to buy t-shirts can get together. Threadless runs a competition every month to, show, to ask for t-shirt designs. Then they ask their community, seven and a half million of them now, I was one of the first 3,000 early adopter, uh, 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 which t-shirts they like the most, and that month they get someone no doubt in China to produce those t-shirts and sell them to the crowd who they've already asked who they want. What they've essentially done in a simple way is take product to a service, a subscription service, because I'm a subscriber, to a marketplace. And that is the, uh, if you like, maturity model on which successful business models on the internet are starting to happen. And I think government has a lot to learn from Threadless and other business models like it. You may recall um, the first few months of my premiership of this state were fairly tumultuous. One of the things that came along was swine flu. Uh, swine flu version one, which turned out to be reasonably innocuous, uh, swept through out of Mexico City across the planet. Uh, I asked, uh, my um, public health officials came to me and said, well, boss, we have to spend a million dollars rolling out clinics to uh, treat Tasmanians who are going to come in with swine flu. To which I said to the public health officials, so well, how will we know? How will we know when this is going to spread and where it's going to spread from and to and so on? Where should we deploy our resources? They said, we don't know. Uh, we need to deploy the resources, sit and wait. As it turns out from uh, some research from the University of Otago, um, the most accurate 24-hour in advance predictor down to street and suburb level of how swine flu one spread out of Mexico City across the world, even into Tasmania, um, are Google searches. That is, I've got a cough, I've heard of this swine flu thing, I go to Google and I type in swine flu. If you aggregate up all of that data across the planet, it is a deadly accurate predictor of how swine flu spread across the planet. Uh, a great example of where I think a digitally empowered, ubiquitously connected crowd or community are far, is far smarter than a thousand policy wonks in a government department. Similarly, scientists who were trying to unravel an AIDS-related enzyme uh, had spent 12 years on this problem, endeavouring to find the ends of this enzyme as an attempt to uh, solve uh, the HIV-AIDS uh, 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 issues. 
as uh, they almost gave up at the end of 12 years when they happened upon the idea, why don't we put it out on the internet and provide some tools for gamers to explore uh, this enzyme. In seven days, the digitally empowered, ubiquitously connected community of gamers across the world had unravelled and solved the problems of this enzyme, something scientists couldn't do in 12 years. Closer to home, the New South Wales government realised they had a problem with their freeway signs. Now, we don't have these signs in Tasmania. That's a global ad, if anyone's watching. Uh, but they're the ones that go five minutes to next exit, 10 minutes to next exit, 15 minutes to the exit after that, and so on. The New South Wales Government Roads Authority realised they had a massive problem with these signs. They were deeply inaccurate. In fact, probably only 60% accurate uh, at any given time. Uh, something that no, no doubt New South Wales commuters knew already. In an, but, and what would normally happen, of course, and as a former CIO in government, uh, we would have written a functional spec, we would have gone to Treasury and asked for a million dollars, we would have put it out to RFT, tender, we would have selected IBM or Price Waterhouse, because no one ever got sacked for selecting IBM. Uh, we would have run it a million and a half over budget, gone back to Treasury, had a parliamentary inquiry. Finally, we would have released the new software, which may have incrementally improved the accuracy of the system. But what the New South Wales government did instead was take, in what I would describe as, a, in the yes minister sense of the word, a courageous decision, <laughs> take all eight years of freeway data from their freeways, put it up on a website, an Australian developed website called kagel.com, K-A-G-G-L-E.com, uh, and ask the digitally empowered, ubiquitously connected community to solve the problem for them. Uh, they offered three months and $10,000 in prize money. Two PhD math students are living like kings in Bogota, uh, in uh, Peru now, uh, who won the $10,000 after 3,500 entries. Um, uh, 3,500 entries, $10,000 prize money. The New South Wales Roads uh, Transport Authority now has an algorithm that predicts uh, the uh, flow of traffic on their freeways with 98% accuracy. Now, this is a uh, very personal graph. It's a graph uh, that you can see on the day I left politics, my <laughs> weight, through to about now, and this is I put down to the Christmas cheer period. Uh, my, I hope you can tell, there's been some changes in my life for the, in the last couple of years, what my wife calls the premiership pounds. Uh, they're gone, hopefully for good. How did I do it, people say to me. Well, I did it with a personally wearable, uh, what I would call not e-health, but me-health device around my wrist. Now, I'm going to ask the audience, and I know smart people, early adopters like Patty Nixon up the back will say yes to this. Who's got a Fitbit or a jawbone or a whatever around their wrist right now? Right. We're a very early adopter sort of crowd, because I reckon that's 20%. I will bet London to a brick when I come back to TEDx 2017 and ask the same question of you, 100%. You will be ubiquitously connected to health devices like this. So what, you might say? Well, given that fat and 40-something blokes like me have a massive contribution to our health issues in this nation, where demand for health services is growing at 21% per annum and post-GFC supply of health services is growing somewhere between 3 and 4%, we've got a massive gap to fill. Given that 50% of all chronic disease in Australia is caused by lifestyle factors, that is fat and 40-something blokes like me, eating, drinking too much or what have you, um, this has real implications. So what if, when this becomes ubiquitous, we're able to do some extraordinary things about solving our own health problems. What if uh, the data that comes from this, not unlike the Google searches, becomes predictive about where we need to deploy health resources? Similarly, many cities now are deploying sensors all across their cities to help uh, com commuters, for example, to understand where the parking spots will be via an app on their smartphone. But more interestingly, aggregating up that data to understand as city planners where they should build more car parks. And of course, and I mentioned Patty Nixon, uh, our Sense T project here in Tasmania is genuinely globally leading when it comes to deploying sensors and thinking about the data sets that can solve old and wicked public policy problems uh, right across uh, the planet. 
But perhaps more interestingly than that, and I know this is something that Sense T understands, the city, when, when we make ourselves the senses and we allow ourselves to become part of the public policy solution, what do I mean by that? Well, in the greatest city of Boston, they have 30,000 kilometres of cycleways. And like any city, they have to maintain them, fix the potholes, do what have you, send out the maintenance trucks. The traditional way might have been to send out someone to walk these paths or ride these paths, find the potholes, schedule maintenance. A more expensive way might be deploy sensors along them and work that out. A much better way, Boston decided, was to write a $5,000 smartphone app, deploy it to their cycling community, and say to their cycling community, if you want better cycleways, switch on the app every time you go for a ride, stick the phone in the back of the Lycra or whatever you wear, uh, and, uh, uh, and of course we will collect the data. And when we aggregate that up, because these have inclinometers in them, when we aggregate that up, we have a deadly accurate up to the second picture of every single pothole on every single kilometre of 30,000 worth of cycleways. An extraordinary new solution to an old public policy problem that's a di that a digitally enabled, ubiquitously connected community can solve, but that the government never could. Similarly, the Massachusetts, uh, the Massachusetts Transit Authority have decided to release all of their data in machine readable form on timetabling and so on for every form of public transport across Massachusetts. There are now over 100 apps available for commuters, for transit riders across Massachusetts to plan their journey to what have you. The Transit Authority spent no money on it at all. A digitally empowered, ubiquitously connected community did all the work for them. Bill Gates said at the early days of the internet, uh, content is king and he got it half right. What I guess I want to leave you with today is that I believe community is king. And by community in this sense, I mean managed public open space in which uh, digitally empowered citizens can uh, provide parts, uh, co-construct public policy uh, solutions. Uh, now, of course, governments deeply understand the provision of physical open public space for us to recreate in and for us to become community in. And they also understand that if you're drunk and disorderly, you're gonna get hauled off in a paddy wagon. There are rules and regulations. But they really have not come to terms yet with providing online public open space that has some rules and regulations that empowers the community to help solve their own problems. In Vancouver, a company called PlaySpeak is providing those sorts of platforms, but it's the type of platform that would enable governments to use a digitally empowered crowd to help solve problems. The crowd is in fact becoming more powerful than companies and government. And I don't mean to say uh, that in some sort of socialist, idealist sort of way. I mean to say that if governments don't provide the platforms and the tools and digitally empower their citizens to co-create solutions, they're going to bite back. And we saw a bit of that with Mel Iron's great work out of Tassie Fires, We Can Help. So back to our old friend Socrates and Plato in finishing. Of course there will be debates and no doubt most of you will walk out of the room and go, yeah, but I don't want the government knowing all that stuff about me and there's a lot of real worry about a ubiquitously connected community and I understand those concerns. But just as Socrates argued, the written word is a bad thing for good oratory, maybe TEDx, we hope, is a good thing for good oratory. Uh, the, the, spo sorry, the spoken word, yeah, the, the written word though, will empower communities. So too will ubiquitous connectivity via the various devices I've talked about today, empower communities to solve old and wicked public policy problems. Thank you for having me.